Daniel Ortiz in Angelo, Texas. We had four large financial unexpected emergencies and I knew that I needed something to give us a little more breathing room. And when he mentioned we can skip two house payments and wipe out credit card debt and loan debt, so that's exactly what I did. I called them and it did change everything. Diane, she was awesome. She was professional. And the important thing with her is she listened. That's what made all the difference in the world. She was patient and anytime that I needed to talk to her, she was there. She texted back. It was a different experience from any other place. Well, I can tell you the difference that it made was over $80,000 for us. It freed up that much. My credit score went up 126 points with Save with Conrad, which made it an 802. My name is Daniel Ortiz, and I freed up $80,000 with SaveWithConrad.com. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! Welcome to something to wrestle with. Brett's Pritchard. Who's Pritchard? Well, you know. That's not a rib. She pooted. She pooted. What a rib. No, you have a There's no box of gimmicks. Rumor and innuendo. I don't deal in rumor and innuendo. It, it, it. Was he there? I was there. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I ain't scared. I ain't scared of shit. Fuck him. You, Bruce. I love you. Double cheeseburger. Double cheese. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? I hate Silva. <laughs> Well, we love you, Bruce. How we you know, love you. A six hour show. We take into account how long it took for Silva to get the technical into this. Right. Well, listen, we're up and running today. We're going to have a good show today because we had so much fun on our 400th episode. We thought, you know what? Let's run it back. Uh, we got hundreds and I mean, hundreds of questions for what you like to call ask me questions and shit. And uh, I think let's just do more of that today. Maybe that'll get you in a better mood. You think that's I'm possible? I'm in a great mood. How can I not be in any better mood than I am today? You are down there in Florida. Yes. And it's warm and you're in your t-shirt. I am up here. Beautiful, sunny Florida you are in. I'm up here in Connecticut. Sunny, beautiful outside. And I'm freezing. Is it cold outside? Yeah, look at me. I'm in a parka. No, but I mean like. In August, it's cold. Yeah, well, dude, you only I, get like I, four days of summer here. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's an endless summer down here. I'm excited. Ooh, you have the second most recognizable athlete in the world on your on your little picture on your t-shirt there. I I think he might be the first most recognizable. Ooh, that's that's Muhammad. Yeah, yeah, Ali. Well, I am, uh, I'm pumped, man. It's a great time to be a wrestling fan. There's so much fun stuff happening all around us. And, uh, we're going to celebrate some of the nostalgia of professional wrestling today with great questions. Like the ones we got from drew Landry. He wanted to know, uh, he writes in, you mentioned how there was talk of turning Hogan heel circa 1991. How would you, how would you have turned Hogan heel? Would it have been the way WCW turned him heel or would you have done it another way? The original idea, you know, we talked about Hulk turning heel because from a creative standpoint, you know, there was what's what's left to do with the superhero. Plus, the audience had begun to turn on Hulk a little bit. They were sick of the eat my vitamins and saying my prayers and Hogan must pose. They were looking for an edgier, edgier talent man i think you know that was one of the reasons that vince brought warrior back was because he was a little bit edgier um so the thought process was man you've run out of opponents on the heel side for hogan you know flip the script and let hogan go to the heel side he's got an entire new roster to work with and uh 
Vince wanted his Babe Ruth and wanted it to be Hogan at that time. And I'm not really sure that Hogan was 100% on board, but I do know that Hulk was enamored, was, was, was intrigued by the thought of going and turning heel. Well, it would have been interesting to see how we could have done that. You know, as a reminder, 1991 is the year where we did the whole Iraqi sympathizer thing. Uh, and so for him to have saved America from Sergeant Slaughter, but somehow later that summer become a bad guy would have been weird or interesting. See how we got well, there. Well, I, I mean, one really easy way would have been for Hogan to be the Iraqi sympathizer. Crazy. That would have been heat. That would have been bad heat. But that would have been heat. Uh, let's do another follow-up question here. Drew always brings the good questions. He wants to know, is Roddy Piper's best match the one with Bret Hart at WrestleMania 8? Or is there another Piper match other than that? I think that the... Uh, and that's where Roddy dropped the Intercontinental title to Bret at WrestleMania 8, right? That's I right, think. yes. Um, thought it was tremendous. But... You know, Roddy wasn't known for having the greatest matches in the world. And Roddy was a brawler. Roddy did what Roddy did. And Roddy did what Roddy did better than anybody else in the world. So um, he wasn't looking to have a great match. Roddy was looking to go out and entertain you and get you to hate him. So I think that was one of his best uh, performances. But I, I think I've seen similar or better. Can't tell you where or when, because I'm going to keep that a secret. Not because I don't know and or remember. It's just because I'm going to keep it a secret. That's what, that's what we do here. Uh, Francis Reyes has some inside baseball for you. He wants to know, what did you miss in your old office that you don't have in the new office at WWE HQ? So uh, I'm not in the new office yet. All right. Um, but but I this will be your third building though, right? Like before there was Titan this, Towers, you had an office somewhere else, right? Yeah, the old I had, building. I started out, so here's where I was going to go, is the the first time that I came up, we were at 1055 Summer Street, downtown Stanford. Nice office. It's now a dentist's office. Um, three floors, and that was okay. Then I went to the TV studio at 120 Hamilton, and I had an office over there. From there, went to Titan Tower, which was uh, the 1241 building. And so for me, it's really kind of surreal and strange when you think about it because came up 1055 summer and I watched them and helped them build the studio. Then when they purchased 1241, I got to see that being built as well. You know, they build the raise the building from the ground up, but the interior of it. And now with the new one uh, doing the same thing, and it's going to be an absolutely magnificent place when it's finished. But I'm still in my old digs, and uh, they'll probably have to sandblast me out of there when it's time, just because I'm a creature of habit and like where it is. Will it be uh, bittersweet? for you and some other long timers to leave Titan towers. Do you think? Yeah, it will. It's just going to be strange. It's going to be different. And for so long, because we, we grew so fast that there were people spread out all over Stanford in different offices that everybody wasn't under one roof. So you never saw for example, Michelle Carlucci, who was my first assistant, I I never see her unless it's a very very special occasion. And you know now, whenever it happens and everybody's in, everybody will be under the same roof. So you can just walk down the hall or walk down the stairs and go see somebody. I'm not walking down any stairs. I'm barely going to walk at all. <laughs> Uh, Josh Rosenbaum, friend of the show says my principal's grandfather is sailor art Thomas. Do you have any stories or history about sailor art Thomas? My principal's grandfather. Yeah. 
you know, Coach, he's he's Coach Rosie, so he uh, he works on a high school. Oh, okay, like, cool. I guess the principal at that school is uh, has a grandfather, Sailor Art Thomas. Oh, very cool, man. Sailor Art Thomas was another one of those guys that was ahead of his time. Sailor had a bodybuilder's body, and in this business, looked uh, much bigger, much stronger, and had great charisma about him. Uh, never got to work with him, never got to meet Sailor Art. But um, I did see some of his work, and he, he reminded me a lot of a young Rocky Johnson. When, mm. when Rocky was young and the way that Rocky worked and the same type of charisma and speed and just a big smile on his face and um, never heard a bad word about him. Here's one from uh, Francis. He wants to know, what did you think of the genetic jackhammer moniker for Vince? And what would Johnny Ace say about it? Uh, as a reminder, this is a, a moniker that Vince was using near the turn of the century, back when Stephanie and Shane were, were going to become more television characters. They even did a WrestleMania with those on McMahon in every corner. So he took a lot of pride in, you know, bragging about being the genetic jackhammer. Uh, what did, was that something that was, uh, I think that's something that just I, came out of his mouth one day. My goodness. It's, uh, it's hilarious. I can see you guys having a lot of fun with that in the booking meeting. Yeah. I just, you know, again, sometimes man, you say things when you're on live TV and it sticks. Uh, Adam wants to know when the WWF was still doing house shows in high schools in the late eighties, did Bruce ever attend or produce those shows? What was that different? What was that like? You know, wrestling has been uh, all over the place. I mean, a lot of times we've seen it in field houses and armories and uh, obviously the, the major arenas, but there were some fundraiser type high school shows. That's a big part of wrestling. WF. Yeah. You-, you know, it's, um, we did a towns, which were your major markets, your, New York, Dallas, Chicago, Houston, L.A., San Francisco, St. Louis, uh, markets like that. And then you had your B markets that were South Bend, Indiana, uh, Indianapolis, um, San Bernardino, San Diego, um, Des Moines, you know, that were kind of a secondary market. And then you had your C towns, which were Altoona, Pennsylvania. Uh, those were your C markets and run like an agricultural hall or, as you said, a BFW. We, I don't know that WWE did a lot of, I mean, I know they did some, yes, but they didn't do a lot of the fundraiser events once they got into the 80s, but they still use those markets and ran in high school gyms and went all over the place to, they had to get exposure. You had so much talent, you wanted to keep them working because they didn't get paid if they didn't work and able to get everybody out on the road and continue to get everyone working every single night. That was the, the reasoning behind it. Uh, J.R. Bestel wants to know who was the one guy who was the most low key and didn't party like some of the boys. Maybe he just stayed in his room that perhaps fans wouldn't have guessed. Was there a low key guy who maybe we wouldn't automatically assume was low key who, who didn't really party besides me? Oh, come on now. You were partying. Um, let me think. Wow. Um, Sure, there was. I, I mean, I'll tell you, you know, Randy Savage didn't go out and party a lot. Okay. It's just, you know, Randy had Liz. Randy would go back to the room and say to himself, Lanny Poffo, same thing. Um, it really, and, and also I think a lot of times it depended upon the market and what, what there was to go and party to. You know what I mean? Right. Like, if you can stay in the hotel and have a few drinks and then go back to your room, ideal. If you had to leave to go somewhere, eh, you know, less and less. There was not as much of a desire to leave, <laughs> to leave your home and then go out and, and party in unknown territory. 
Here's an interesting question. You know, I've never talked about on or off the air. Super blurred DJ says, I understand this happened when you were away from WWE, but what did you think? Constantine Cairo's class action lawsuit that was dismissed in 2018. You know, we, we heard that name a lot, Bruce. It felt like anytime hey, any broke up on the, on the, I guess on the name. Constantine Kairos. Don't know. Okay. It was he a worker. No, I think he was a guy who, uh, anytime a, a disgruntled former WWE talent had an issue, it felt like they just went to him and, you know, they all tried to sue WWE for this or that or whatever. Was that the guy that would call all the talent and say, Hey, did you work for WWE? Do you want to join our class action suit? That'd be him. Yes. That's the only way I know about him. Yeah. And he, I, you know, um, he called you. I received a call like that. Yeah. Yeah. Could, I could not tell you their name, but it was, did you work there? Were you ever injured? Uh, we have a class action lawsuit and you'll get millions of dollars and so on and so forth. And, uh, we're right on the cusp of winning. We just want you to be a part of it so that you can get your rightful pay. Sound like a television commercial. <laughs> you know, do yeah. you have a nagging injury from all those bumps that you took? Yeah. If that's the same guy, I don't know if it is, but that's the only kind of exposure I ever had with them. I didn't, didn't like dealing with, uh, and like dealing with lawyers <laughs> at all. <laughs> so no, I never did. Well, something we both like doing is using our Henson razor. We think you got to meet Henson shaving. We are a big fan of this product. Uh, I have one in my travel bag. I have one here in Florida. I have one at home. Uh, I've even convinced my barber to get one. It's the best razor I've ever had. And what's amazing is this wasn't even their first plan. You see. This is an aerospace parts manufacturer who've made parts for the International Space Station and the Mars Rover. But what they realized is, hey man, we got aerospace grade CNC machines here that make metal razors that are thinner than you can imagine. How thin? How about thinner than a human hair? 0. 0.0013 inches. And what that allows you to have is less wobble, which means fewer nicks and cuts and scrapes. This is the best shave I've ever had. It gives you a secure and stable blade with a vibration free shave and the Henson razor has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream. And that's going to make clogging virtually impossible. You see what I really like about Henson is normally when something is better, it's more Henson is, is better, but it's actually more affordable. And that's, what's amazing. These guys didn't want to make the best razor business. They wanted the best razor. There's nothing plastic about this. There's no subscriptions, there's no proprietary blades, there's no planned obsolescence, and it uses a standard dual edge blade like your handsome ass grandfather used to use. It's very old school, but it gives you the benefits of new school tech. Pop Pop never had a razor this thin. By the way, once you own this razor, it's only three to $5 a year to replace the blades. Think about that. It's time to say no to subscriptions. It's time to say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit HensonShaving.com slash wrestle to pick the razor for you and use the code wrestle and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just be sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades. When you head to H E N S O N S H A V I N G.com slash wrestle and use the promo code wrestle. Uh, let's get back to it here. Um, <sighs> I don't know why this is, this is funny, but Mr. Milkman to you wants to know what's the worst gift anyone ever gave you for Christmas or a birthday. You don't have to mention who gave it to you. Just mention the terrible gift. Well, one time in Houston, this gentleman, he did ceramics and he brought Paul Bosch a gift for Christmas and Paul opened it up and it was about, you know, yay big, like, um, the size of a electric, uh, like an electric frying pan type thing. Okay. About maybe a foot tall and it had all these little caverns and like little, places to 
put things with coverings on it, but everything was unique and it was all very black lacquer with uh, speckled paint on it. And it was an ashtray. But huge. Huge. Yeah. And so like you lift up, there was like a little place, there's a little lid. You could put your cigarettes in there. Then there was a place to put your lighters. Paul doesn't smoke. But Paul looked at it and goes, um, you know, he thanked the guy. Very kind. Of course. And, uh, and then Paul gave it to me. And I started to think of all the different ways that I could use it. Oh. And, you know, I, I would put other things in it and things like that. But then I got to thinking, man, it's already half wrapped. And I started uh, the chain of wrapping it and giving it to other people. <laughs> <laughs> and then it would make its way around to other people. And believe it or not, that shit came back to me. Someone gifted it back to you. Yeah. Someone I didn't even know had had it gifted to them, gifted it back to me. I love that so much. Yeah. It was, it was good. That was a good one. You know, I've done that with a few different things where it's like everybody gets the gift and go, oh, hey, yeah, no, here, man, I got you something. And it goes around the horn and you see it and you go, hey, where'd you get that? Man, I made that. Just for Conrad. Now Silva's got it. What the hell? We've all been there. We've all been there. Well, you got an extra present when you came home from uh, vacation. Has Silva been to your house when you've been gone down in Florida? Um, no, uh, he doesn't go over uh, since we had the whole uh, duking on the floor do, controversy. Do on the floor? Yeah, no, yeah. now uh, Cassio, it was there recently. So if I go did back and there's a pile. The well, that, I don't know. I hadn't been back, but the point is, if Cassio is down there, I mean, I know he was, but if there is a plop on the floor, then I'll know Silva has been cleared of altars. No, oh, wow, I'll bitch. <laughs> you would know then that Cassio invited Silva over is all you would know. I got you. Um, hey, Bruce, it's me, your boy, MCU Doot Doot Doot. Uh, what was the biggest thing you learned during your time with TNA? My biggest what? What did you learn? What was the biggest thing you learned in TNA, your time in TNA? I, believe it or not, I think I learned an awful lot in TNA. Um, one of the approaches in coming from a different mindset, coming from uh, looking at your mentors and looking at the people that came before you that were successful, like Bill Watts and... Um, you know, Vince and just different, different ways to handle things. And I think when I was in TNA, I, I was still had a lot of that dogmatic, dogmatic personality of, you know, attacking and you, you know, you, you pick out everything that is wrong with something to try to make it better. And one day it was reminiscent of, of, Randy Savage saying, yeah, you just could have been nicer was uh, Bully Ray coming back and, and saying, goes, goddamn Bruce, do, do I ever do anything right? And I said, you do a lot of things right. It's just, I want you to get better at these. He goes, well, then would you just, just once pat me on the ass and, and tell me the things I did right. And that sunk in with me because it was like when all you're hearing is negative, 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 then, you know, you become negative. And, and he was right about that because it was I, I had found myself in that groove of just correcting people and forget about what they did well. Um, and I think that was one a, a really good lesson to learn and that. I've always kind of had a philosophy since I was a kid. Don't take life seriously because you're not going to make it out alive. All right. Um, so you can't sweat the small shit and it's all small shit. So don't sweat it. Let's, uh, let's do another one here. This one comes to us from, uh, Scott Blaine. 
And this is going to be interesting because I think we probably need to exclude current, the modern day talent who would be on Bruce's Mount Rushmore of women's wrestlers. So if we look back a generation ago, uh, backwards, uh, cause I, I don't think it's necessarily fair to include current talent. So let's go old school, if you will. You know, funny. Um, I did have a conversation about Mount Rushmore's and everything. And I think that they are generational. Um, if you were trying to do a Mount Rushmore today, a president's, I'm not sure the guys that are on Mount Rushmore now would be anywhere close to being on it. Truth be told. Um, and everyone has their own opinions. If you were to look at it generational back in the day, you would have Mildred Burke, you would have the fabulous Mula, uh, May Young, and probably a Betty Nikolai or a Susie Green would be the from that generation of, of women wrestlers. But Mildred and Mula and May, man, they broke the mold. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Instagram, a wrestling historian says, I was wondering why WWE stopped doing the hall of fame after 1996 until bringing it back to 2004. We know when it came back in 2004, it was a much bigger deal. It was more of a banquet type thing in the nineties, but why the break do you think Bruce? I just think that it was more a situation of were there really that many eligible people for, for the hall of fame. And, and I think, you know, when you have to do it, you, you start to fill in the blanks. Well, we need somebody for, from this era. We need someone for this. We need someone for that. We need someone for that versus having a bunch of people that can accumulate that truly deserve to go into a hall of fame. That's all. I just think it was a respite because there was a feeling that let's let's give it some time and let when we come back, we'll have a lot more to put in. Let's talk a little bit about uh, a name I hadn't heard a ton of. This is from Horror Movie Barbecue. What are your memories of Conan Chris Walker, who you would have spent time with in the WWF and Global back in the day? Yeah, I don't think Chris was there when I was in Global, but uh, you know, Chris was one of those guys that had what appeared to be all the tools chiseled body he looked like Tarzan in the, in the movies. Um, not George Reeves, but the, the other Tarzan, he was ripped long blonde hair, but uh, it was just a situation of, I don't know that he was ever ready. I don't know that he ever got it. He could do moves. He could do some big splashy things. Beyond that, I don't know that he was a great promo guy or a good talker. So when you add it all up, he was an okay enhancement talent, but he looked great standing there. Yeah, he did. Uh, Adam Arpin says in the eighties and nineties, we got a lot of TV shows and movies centered around aliens. One of which actually starred Roddy Piper. So why did the WWF never have a superstar who claimed to be an alien or maybe abducted by one? And who would have been a good talent to pull that gimmick off? Listen, that sounds a little silly, but I do remember, you know, the national Enquirer and silly shows on TV, you know, people were always talking about UFO sightings and I was abducted and there was a probe and blah, blah, blah. You remember that ever being seriously considered in the WWF? I told you the story about the end of the event and the Martian spaceship landing on titan tower oh wait you know what you did briefly but why don't you share that story again we had had hugo savinovich working in the office with us and uh we were talking about how do we end this pay-per-view i forget what it was maybe in an in your house or something when hugo was like i have it and he goes what if we go and we like have the end of the pay-per-view and at the end of the pay-per-view everything goes snowy and then when the picture comes to 
it's of the Titan Tower. And then we see a spaceship and it lands on the Titan Tower. And then it goes, you know, like snowy again. And we go to black. Pat and I are sitting there and we're going, okay. Um, then what? Oh, I don't know. I just think it would be a cool ending. But then he went on to explain that you go and that it's uh, like the doors opens and it's Martian people and they come out to run the WWE. Mar- Mar- I'm sorry, Martian people? Martian. Mar- marching? Marching. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm I'm glad you guys I know we almost that. did it. Yeah. But the Martians were booked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh Horror Movie Barbecue says, Why were Hulk and Warrior considered heroes despite attacking Brother Love for simply spreading the word of love? You know, you and I've talked about that before. A lot of times Hogan even wrestled like a bad guy. Uh Hogan but in was, theory, Hogan was a heel. Yes. Yes. Warrior but was why? a heel. But they're beating you up for no reason. What were you doing that was so awful? Nothing. That's what I'm saying. I take a great ass kick, and that's what I do. That's my job. But when you go back and you look at it, we always laugh at this, is Hulk wrestled as a heel, and the audience loved it. Mm-hmm. Warrior wrestled as a heel. The audience loved it. Savage, on down the line. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Wrestle, he was a heel. Yes. But the audience loved it. Yes. So um, I think that was the beauty that a lot of people didn't really understand that sometimes the heel has to bend the rules a little bit to take down evil and corruption and bullshit. Uh, Anthony has an interesting question we've never really discussed on the program. How do you prepare a tribute show? Like how is the preparation for Raw as Owen or Raw as Eddie? Match-wise, just a feeling backstage, it has to be different. It's terrible. I mean, it's, it's, you, you try to think of the best way to honor their careers. And we asked people as they came in, you know, this is, this has happened and, uh, Eddie's not with us and. If you'd like to say something, we'll have an opportunity for you to say something. If you'd like to wrestle, we'll we'll find a match. And that's how you do it. You just you get through it. You know, you know, the the thing is is that no matter what you do on anything, people are going to second guess and and have an opinion that you should have done it the other way. Right. Um that was the way that we chose to do it on, on several different occasions where uh, very unfortunate situations were laid before us. You're in live TV when, you know, the president is shot, the news doesn't go off the air. They've got to, as difficult as it is, they've got to continue to give you the news. And they've got to continue to tell you what the weather's going to be tomorrow. Um, and that was kind of our role. And I think that sometimes we would look at it and say, let's, let's remember, but entertain at the same time, because this is also an outlet for people. Right. That the audience comes in there. They want an outlet from all the crap out in the world. And they just want to suspend their disbelief for two or three hours uh, twice a week and and move on. So, you know, it's difficult, but er- everyone, I think, was different in that, you know, we, we would approach people and see who wanted to be a part of it. And everybody had that choice. 
G Brock wants to know were Shawn Michaels and Brent Hart, et cetera, nervous about their spot in 1996 when the ultimate, uh, the ultimate warrior was returning. So as a reminder at the time, Kevin Nash is on his way out. Scott Hall's on his way out. Undertaker, Sean and Brett, clearly the top three guys. Do you remember there being specific conversations about, Hey, what does this mean for me with the ultimate warrior coming back? Or was that not a thing? Yeah, it's funny. The, um, there were conversations, sure. Is this where Vince wants to go? We've all been working our ass off. But there was also real conversations that went on about how long is this one going to take? Mm. And is he you know, is he going to be here next week? And, and it really didn't take that long. So those conversations also took place. A lot of the guys just felt that, okay, it's a matter of time till he implodes. And others were, okay, I let it run its course. Yeah. And, and it always uh, did. Uh, piggybacking on a recent King of the Ring episode, does Bruce think the King of the Ring is better suited for a heel or a baby face? So who should win? Who should carry it for the next year? Who would be most effective? A bad guy, King of the Ring, or a good guy? I always liked an unpopular king. Yeah. Because it's tough to be king. That's Booker. Booker was tough. But a guy, and, and again, it also, you take a guy like Owen Hart, a guy like Booker T, you know, Lawler, that embraced that king gimmick. And, and made it what it is. You know, even Harley. Harley was king, man. Yeah, Harley did a good job as king. He did. Uh, Michael Burgett says, recently I heard there were three out of five fall matches back in the day. Did Bruce ever see that type of match going back to his days in Houston? So we've heard a lot of two out of three falls, but three out of five. Do you ever see one of those, Bruce? Not that I can recall. We were a two out of three fall town in Houston. Our semifinal and main event were two out of three falls. Semifinal was usually either a 30 or 45 minute time limit. And the main event was a 60 minute time limit. So very rarely did we have uh, in the main event, like a one fall to a finish or one fall 90 minute time limit. Well, if you're looking to go one fall for 90 or maybe three out of five, I know what you can do to help. Blue Chew, it's going to make you feel like you were a kid again. It's a unique online service that delivers you the same active ingredients as in Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Think of it as like a hot tag for your wiener. Take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. And the process is so simple, y'all. You'll sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluechew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Russell at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is Russell. You receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. Uh, here's uh, an interesting question we've never discussed. Aaron Sheik wants to know, what's the smallest crowd you've ever seen for a live event? Oh, God, I've seen crowds that didn't even fill up the front row. So, like, you know, 20 people. Probably the smallest crowd I've ever seen. I mean, I've worked in front of plenty of crowds that were 100, 150 in high school gyms, rodeo arenas, you know, you talk about working in front, <laughs> you talk about working in front of small audiences, you know, back in the day, I would be the ring announcer, timekeeper, referee, and put up the ring and set up the chairs. We would go to rodeo arenas 
set the ring up in the middle of the um right in the middle of the dirt where the rodeo took place we'd set the ring up in the middle and people had the stands there was no place really to put any chairs so what we did is we offered people uh special ringside that consisted of you bring your own chair so you can bring you can bring lounge chairs sit back and oh boy watch your your favorites whatever and they were sparse I mean, like you could you could hear every single person in the audience. But I used to have to get up and I would announce that I had like one of those plastic megaphones mm -hmm. where I would go, ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, we did it. And I'd point. Then I'd roll out of the ring. I'd ring the bell. And then I would, you know, roll back in the ring, start the match. My goodness. Have the match one, two, three. I would roll out of the ring and ring the bell. So, and I would do that sometimes in front of a hundred people or less. Wow, crazy! Steve Clark wants to know after hearing the nearly getting shot story with JBL when you went to the wrong house to film, do you have any other interesting or weird things that happened at remote filmings? I know Taker and Foley did some beauties back in the day. I think the uh, shooting the opens to Shotgun Saturday Night had their challenges because we didn't have any permits to shoot in New York. So found a taxi driver, gave him some money, and said, I need you to just stay right here. Do not move. Don't do anything. Stay here. And he was basically blocking two lanes of traffic while Sean danced on top of his taxi. It was in the open of Shotgun Saturday Night. But we stopped traffic in Times Square on a Friday night. So if you can imagine how bad Times Square is all week long, any time of the day, rush hour traffic on a Friday afternoon. Sean Michaels get dancing. And I remember telling Sean, whatever you do, don't, don't drop your pants. And when you get the queue, we had a car beside him. We had a path of our cars that could move so that we could get the limo out of there immediately. So if you see the, the queue from me, you dive in that limo and that limo goes and all the cars go at the same time. So when the cops got there and Sean looked and saw the sign and he did the one thing I asked him not to do, he dropped his pants and then he jumped in the top of that car and off they went. You know, that was, the, those were fun. Uh, same, same night, same shoot. There were, you know, the holes, manhole covers and stuff. We mm -hmm. see all the steam billing me out of those in Manhattan yep. the place. We saw a good one, and it was in a work area, kind of cordoned off. Undertaker was in his stuff, so I said, hey, what if you go over there? I said, just go, just walk down. Just go down far enough so we don't see your head. Wait five seconds, and then come back up like you're coming out of a manhole cover. And Undertaker went down in his gear, came up, walked away, and then about – God, five, six seconds after he was up and, and out and had walked away, you see all the guys from the manhole scurrying up to the top, looking around like, oh, my God, that was Undertaker. That was Undertaker. But you just, you, you could do it back then. If somebody asked me if I had a permit, of course I do. Yes, sir. Thank you. No, okay, see you. <laughs> Again, with confidence, you would be surprised how much they go. Oh yeah, okay, he's good. Yeah, I said he's got one. He's good. And then they would ask me to see it. I said, "Oh, sir, I, I don't have that. My my assistant has that." Where's your assistant? So she's in Stanford. Well, I need to see it. Okay. Thank you. It's like Jedi mind tricks, man. 
you know, you'll get the asshole every once in a while that will do their job. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I was going to say, they're not an asshole. They're doing their job. Yeah, you'll get those guys every once in a while that will throw you out. But you shoot that so that it makes good TV. Yes. Nine times out of ten, I can bullshit my way out of it. Like, yes, sir. Of course I do. Thanks for asking. I love that. Because, sir, could you could you move? You're in the shop. Or, hey, would you like to be in this? Hey, hey speaking of uh, of bullshitting, you got a little bit of backlash for last week's show. I don't know if you saw over the weekend, but a lot of people took issue with what you said about Dark Side of the Ring. That you know they're they're not telling the truth and it's lies. Uh, they're not talking about the happy shit and they don't use fact checkers. And, you know they check just enough and all that sort of stuff. You got a little bit of criticism and a little bit of backlash and people were saying, "Oh, you mean like your podcasts?" Uh, so I just wanted to give you a chance to respond if you saw any of that criticism of your comments about Dark Side. Okay, my podcasts are my facts they're what has happened to me and there are stories that i tell about my experiences my actual experiences in the business okay if you choose to think that they're bullshit then choose to think they're bullshit it's america we still live in america i think and that's your right your privilege and what have you as far as uh the, the dark side of the ring i specifically was looking at certain situations where one, they I know they had the information because I gave them the information and cautioned them against some things. And then later on, they, they never checked, and they could have checked. They could have checked things out and instead just went with the dirtiest, the sleaziest side of the story without having a balance and a counterpoint to it. Now, you know, maybe, maybe they don't do that anymore, but the ones that I saw and the ones that I am – in particular, you know, upset about, um, I know that those were things that they could have come to me. And I know on a couple of them that I had specifically told them, Hey, be careful with that because you're not getting the whole story here. And they've caused people's jobs and things like that and creative editing. And anytime you do one of those, you know, that the editor is the guy that's going to, um, uh, Get the make last break laugh, if you will. Yeah, make a break. Yeah. And yeah. they're going to edit in a way to make it as sensational as it can be. And as I prefaced it, in my old age, I'm getting tired of the negative. I've done a lot of negative. I've been a part of a lot of negative. And after a while, it's like, I'd rather find the silver lining mm -hmm. and to put people's careers in jeopardy because of something they may have said on an interview and have it edited to fit another narrative, I don't think it's fair. And this is my, this is my opinion. These are my stories. Okay. If you don't like it, don't listen. And I'm fine with that. But this is what I've lived. I've actually done it. I've been in this business since I was 10 years old. That is 50 yep. years. A lot longer. I've been in the business longer than a lot of our listeners have been alive. Definitely longer than the folks that produce that television show have been alive. So trying to, to help them, and I did it. I did the first season. Had no idea how it was going to turn out. But I did it. You know why I did it, Conrad? I did it for the money, and I did it for the exposure. You called me, told him about him. I talked to him. And again, that's where I, I got to, I like the producers. Yeah. Evan and Jason are great guys. And, and we got I, to see, uh, I don't, I don't like what, I don't like the way that their shows are edited and put together to just show, um, negative about a business that I truly love. And I know there's a lot of negative out there. Well aware of that, but a lot of times there's two sides to stories that in the things that I've seen, it's like, and, and things that are just so easy to check up on that they just didn't do and put people in hot water. Got some people, you know, in positions where they'll, 
they'll never work where they want to work ever again because some of the things that were said on that and edited in ways to make it sound horrible. But but also, I just don't think that they uh, did their homework. And they used to, look, they used to call me before I came back here and ask me, you know, hey, what is there anything to this guy's story? Is there anything to this? And I said, look, that's their story. Here's another version of how it happened. Hmm. But always, you know, always do your homework. And my opinion, and that's all it is, and it's my show. So it's my opinion. My opinion is, is that I don't want to deal in the negative. I don't want to deal in, in things that are just blatant, out and out, wrong, bad, bad journalism, bad television. Um, when they had the truth and they just chose to ignore it. Um, that's all. So I, I don't, again, the uh, human beings, I like them both. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. But I, I don't like, and I've, and I, and, and guys, if you're listening, you know, I told you that from day one. When we sat down and you guys went through this shit, and I told you, yeah, that's not how it happened. This is how it happened. And that here's, here's what nobody else will tell you. And when you choose to go on and believe people like Dave Meltzer, who has never spent one day in this business working, he is a reporter. Great report. But don't he's not an expert. He's an expert on rumor and innuendo. He's an expert on stirring shit. So when you make the choice to use him as your source, then your entire product suffers because lack of credibility from someone who has never, ever worked in the business, who doesn't really know, who has only heard about certain things and only reported the things that he wanted to report because of a personal bias one way or the other. So that's all. I, I just uh, was probably in a bad mood last week too, but uh, I was probably tired and grumpy and all that other stuff, but that's, that's all. That's all I mean. It, it's uh, the human beings got no problem with the, the show itself. I think went from a place of an investigative show to a place of a gotcha show and let's see who we can tear apart dead or alive with rumor and innuendo. That Bruce, I want to, yeah, it does. But I, I could tell as you were talking that there were uh, at least a moment or two or a story or two that really bothered you. Yeah. Uh, what can you, can you tell us what one of those were? Well, good Lord, man. The, the plane ride from hell where they took, several different plane rides and presented them as one. Again, not fair in a narrative that they were warned about. That one, that they were warned about. Owen Hart's tragic. Um, you know, there's two right there. Did you have a problem with the Gino episode? Because um, I felt like, I, I remember you and I discussing something on that episode. And you were like, I don't remember exactly what it was, but there was something you were like that, that that's not the way that went down. I just thought when you were talking, yeah. it had to be the Gino thing, something on that. No, it's, it's been a few. It's, yeah. it's really been a few. And you know, the, the Gino may have been one, the, the, it's just. The vibe again, is off for you. It is. Yeah. It is. And that may be nothing more than an old man yelling at clouds. Right. That's but fair. I'm an old man and I have the right to yell at clouds. And I've got yeah, a podcast I'm... in which I can express my opinions and my viewpoints. And I'm sure they can express their opinions and their viewpoints too. And that's cool. And again, I enjoyed having them at my house. Uh, we had a good time. They spent several days at my house doing interviews and things. But during those times, not on camera, uh, I was trying to help them to be wary 
of what you get and check it up. Check it up. Just uh, don't take just my word or anybody else's word for it. Go get the other side. And one way or another, you know, you're going to find, you'll find the truth maybe somewhere in the middle there, but it's not, uh, when, when it's just so obvious and when it's a certain agenda, I don't like the agendas. That's all. And I mean, and look, man, that's me. Other people may go, oh, goddamn, Bruce, you do it on your show. Well, you know what? It's my show. And this show was not edited. No, that's so, true. No, we're live to tape. You know, you, you get us with all of our warts, and uh, sometimes I'll say things that may be controversial, and I may say them in a flippant way in the moment, because that's what I do. <laughs> and it's it is what it is. So I, I invite you and, and even our audience and audiences of those types of programming before you believe that that is the absolute end all be all do a little research and, and some of it's not that difficult to do. It really isn't when you, when you can put up a piece of tape and realize that no, that didn't happen at all, but their reenactment of it or their editing of it makes it a completely different scenario. I don't know. I look and it's America. It's their prerogative to do it. So have at it. You you asked me if I liked the show. You asked me if I'd seen something on Marty Gennetti. Um yeah. and and then you asked me about the show and I gave you my honest feelings on it. And um it's not it's not something that I really want to see anymore. I think, uh, I think you hurt one of my friend's feelings last week with it, but you were giving your opinion and I do want to give you props for, we don't edit this show. And, and I know there's a, don't, because sometimes you do hear a snafu, but we leave it in, uh, and we leave it in not because we're lazy, but because we want it to be real. And I have done podcasts with other folks who call me an hour later or a day later and say, Hey, can you edit that out? Hey, I've thought better of that. I mean, that's happened with every, almost every other host except you. Uh, we just leave it all in. Well, because, and if we could do it live, we would do it live. Yes. Yes. And so we, we choose to do it live to tape and we choose to leave all the fuck ups in here, folks. Yeah. So that it can be real so that you can get the feeling of two guys that don't always get the opportunity to speak to each other during the week. You That's hear right. us having a conversation here during this time to give it a, a more genuine feel. Because that is what this is. And whoever's feelings I hurt, um, bummer, I'm sorry. Uh, didn't say it to, to hurt feelings. I said it simply as how a feeling that I have. And I think I explained why I have it mm -hmm. today. And whether, whether you know it or not, you really screwed up some people's lives in editing things and changing um changing the facts around to fit your narrative that can't be undone and and that's just not fair and it's 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 always astonished me too that when you you talk to people doing docs and doing different things they want, they have a narrative. They want to get out, man. They want, this is the story we're going to tell. We're going to go down this avenue. Yeah, but that avenue is not nearly as good as the truth. And here's, listen to the truth. You won't believe this shit. Hmm. And they'll listen to it and go, oh my God, that's, nobody would believe that. Oh my God, that's crazy. I said, yeah, that's the point. But you've never heard that side of it. And that's the real side of it and why they did things. But maybe there's a character in that story that, that they want to bury or that they want to burn. So they don't want to know that, hey, you know what? Maybe this character isn't as bad as they say he is. If he did all this shit. But holy fuck, look at this. All these other things that happened. It's, uh, 
yeah, it's a narrative that everybody has a choice, man. Everybody has a choice. And I think that on some on some of those things, man, they had done it in the past. And when I came up here, uh, they stopped doing it and would call me and ask me. And I would say, yeah, man, that's just not the way it was. Mm. And some of those things, they blatantly aired what I had cautioned them on. I didn't say don't air it. I said, mm, that ain't what happened. And here's here's where you're wrong. Here's where you're confused. And they went ahead and did it their way. And they probably would have given you an opportunity to retort if you could have appeared, though, right? I mean, I realize you know that ship sailed when you went back. You can't appear on that show anymore. I get that, but. They've aired a lot of point counterpoints before where someone says something and then we get another voice that refutes that, but you just weren't available to do so, right? No, and I and frankly, I wouldn't do it with them. I'd do it live. Right. Okay. I, I would never I would I would never give them the I never give them the opportunity to, to put something on tape again now. Do you or do you worry about that, not just with Dark Side, but with everyone? I mean, you've yes. seen Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, there you go. You answered the question. Big time, big time. Because it, it, it's, I saw something uh, at one point very recently of a documentary interview that I did, and I saw their cut. And everybody looked at me sideways and said, where's the question? Mm. Well, people get it. I said, no, you took it out of context. I answered a specific question in there. And then you took half, you took the first line of my answer and edited out the rest of the answer and never had the question. So it's like literally me in the middle of something uh, trashing someone, mm. but yet there was no question and there was really no answer. There was me making a smart ass comment before I made the answer. So um everybody does it and that's why i i will not you know and, and again anybody that uses dave Meltzer as an expert you you know you what you get what you pay for and, and if you're going to use him then that's what you're going to get you're going to get a wrestling observer newsletter Man, I'll tell you what, this, uh, this conversation is going to drive me to drinking. Uh, but before I get started, I got to realize I got to get up early tomorrow and I hate feeling miserable the day after drinks, but luckily there's a game changing product called Z biotics here to help Z biotics, pre-alcohol probiotics is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. Let me explain. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. And here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut, and it's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Think of it as like it's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut, where you need it most. Drink Zbiotics before drinking, drink responsibly, and then enjoy the night with confidence. And I have to admit, I wasn't too sure about this. I, I was under the old wives tale of, oh, well, you just drink a bunch of water the next day. Nope. As we just explained, dehydration, that's not it. So I thought, okay, let's try it. I did it a few years ago at podcast movement. And when I was out hanging and banging with Eric Bischoff and my goodness, we bounced back. We were on stage the next morning telling our tales and we felt great. I give all the credit to Z biotics. I haven't been able to bounce back like I used to in a long time. Now I can with Zbiotics. Labor Day weekend's right around the corner, boys and girls. Make sure you stock up before the long weekend. If you're hosting, you got the pool party, you guys are going out on the boat, you got the barbecue going, make sure you take care of your friends and family. They're all going to thank you. Savor the moment. Let Zbiotics do the rest. Go to zbiotics.com slash stww to get 15% off your first order when you use stww at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee so if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember, head to zbiotics.com slash STWW and use the code STWW at checkout for 15% off. And we thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring today's episode. 
Oh, it is the, the best. It is. You I'm glad you like it. You know, I do love it. I, I, pro tip, folks, order by the case. But use our promo code. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? Uh, hey, here's a great question. Dave Pearson says, hypothetically, if you knew you had Hogan until SummerSlam 93, how would you have booked King of the Ring and SummerSlam when it pertains to Hogan, Yoko, and Brett with the WWF title? So as we all recall, uh, Hogan dropped the title to Yoko at uh, King of the Ring. There's lots of rumor and innuendo that Hogan and Brett were going to wrestle for the title. At there was a photo shoot allegedly with the tug of war. We covered all this in the archives. We know Hogan wound up not wrestling in the States again, but he did do a European tour with you guys. And then that run with the WWF was over before you know it. He's with WCW. But what if we knew that Hogan's Hogan was going to finish up at SummerSlam? What if we knew for sure he's here until SummerSlam and then we're done, what would you have changed? If anything, I'd have had Brett beat him at King of the Ring and then had a triple threat with Brett, Yoko, and Hogan and have Yoko beat him at SummerSlam. Okay. All right. Perfect. Or, so, it, it, yeah, right. I get that. But Luger at that point, that whole story changes too. So that would have meant no Lex Express, right? Thank God. <laughs> Uh, Joshua Drown says, if you had the chance to book Jack and Gerald Briscoe in their prime, who would you pair them up with, be it a singles match or a tag match? Fox. Oh, yeah. Greatest like tag that. team rivalry in the history of the business. You know, they went every they went everywhere, all over the world, literally, and were able to do huge business. You know, it's two brother teams, two of the best brother teams. On one side, you had two former NWA World Heavyweight Champions. On the other side, you had an NWA World Heavyweight Champion and an NWA Junior Heavyweight Champion. Um, in Oklahoma versus Texas, by God. But it was a rivalry that felt real because it was a family rivalry that I think most people could relate to as well. Richie Ray, the real deal heel on Twitter, wants to know the pop up toaster for Ray Mysterio. Did that lift idea come from Garth Brooks? Garth used to do that at his concerts. That's a fair question. I don't know. <laughs> it, you know, it came up. It was something that we, you know, talked about. I don't know if someone saw it. At Garth Brooks, I, I've been to many Garth Brooks concerts. I don't remember Garth ever doing that, but I'd say that he didn't. The guys that we worked with definitely toured and did a lot of stuff out of Nashville and did a whole bunch of country music stuff so that they they may have seen it and say, hey, this would be great for A. But I don't think I'd ever seen it. I'd, I'd like the idea. I'll be damned. Uh, has, I'm going to put a little spin on it at the end with the current creative brain trust getting older and older. How are you preparing for the future? The PC does not offer instruction on wrestling creative and what makes it different from regular TV. What are we going to do, Bruce? Uh, you know, listen, I don't necessarily need you to answer that, but I do. It did make me think of this question. Why do you think there's not like a developmental for WWE creative or is there, we just don't hear about it. There is, and you don't hear about it. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, Matt wants to know what was, or is Bruce's favorite restaurant in Houston, Texas? Mm. So many, I, it's, it's hard. Okay. If you want great street tacos, uh, La Tierra, it's al at the Alabama ice house on West Alabama. And right across the street is a taco truck. Uh, I think it's called La Tierra. Tacos, best street tacos in anywhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, best breakfast tacos or brothers tacos down on, used to be Dowling Street. What the fuck's it called now? Emancipation Parkway or something like that. Uh, at the corner of Pease and, and Dowling. Uh, Irma's, downtown Houston, uh, off Chenevert. Go in, see Irma. Go see your brother, Tony. Uh, tell him I sent you. The they don't have a menu, but they'll make you whatever you want. And um, probably best seafood 
is going to be um, – I, I like – Captain Benny's. Uh, I used to like Tony Mandola's. Tony Mandola's has the best fried shrimp, you know, anywhere. Um, and barbecue, uh, Luling Street Barbecue. That's it. That's all. If you want, if if you want to get a uh, food poisoning and rooster tail up a wall after oysters, where should That's you? That's on you, man. <laughs> I didn't get food poisoning. Yeah, well, you, we didn't eat the same oyster either, smart ass. Well, no, that's I know, but I didn't get food poisoning. I was just saying, man, I was fine. I ate everything and I was okay. I had yeah, no poo poos coming out. I wait till yeah. I get back to Alabama and I go poo poo on the floor. I don't want to go poo poo on a nice floor in the in the hotel. <laughs> uh, Greg wants to know: Was there ever any alternate wardrobe for Brother Love considered, or was it always going to be the white suit and the red shirt? My head, there was it was always a white suit, red shirt. I think in Vince's head, Vince wanted me to gradually get nicer and nicer clothes and start ending up with really, really expensive clothes every week and something different every week, um, which I should have done. We would have got some nice clothes paid for, but I liked the uniform of the, yes. the white and the red, and I thought it was striking. And it gave and it gave me a look. I think if we had done the the different outfits every single week, um, I don't know. I don't know. I I could have still been brother love, but it just would have been different. No doubt. Uh, Jason wants to know. Other than your own, what's your favorite WWE action figure? Uh. Dusty and polka dots. Mm, that's a good one. It is. And I, you know, it really pisses me off more than anything is I have it. I have like one of the absolute first ones and he signed it and it's faded. The, the signature has just faded where you can barely see it at all. But I have, I have that. I have the t-shirt commemorative t-shirt that went with it. And, uh, Dusty was so happy to get that. And I remember sitting in his little office there and pulling it in. Check it out. And he said, let me see that. He signed it for me <laughs> and gave it to me and threw a shirt at me. And that's, that's probably uh, of action figures. I'm not an action figure guy, but yeah, that one, without a doubt. Whenever we were asking for these questions, we showed that famous picture of you, Pat, and Kevin Nash backstage uh, wearing those ridiculous sweaters. J.S. Trudel wants to know, do you still own that particular sweater? We posted a few years ago that you had a vest that was like that, but I think it was Coogee. Is that right? Is that who yes. made this? Coogee sweaters, yes. Do, do you still have the one in that famous picture that everybody talks about? Of course. I do. Why do you, why do you still have it? Still fits. So you just keep it's everything nice. that fits forever. The nice stuff, yeah. Uh, you, so we're calling that nice. Yes, it's very nice. Okay. I wear it. Right. Least, I wear it at least once a year. Uh, can you promise whether us I have to or not? Will you post a picture to social next time you wear it, please? Sure. I may wear it. I, you know what? We may hit a cold day here and I won't feel like turning the heater on. I may wear it on a show. Oh, fuck. Bitch. Please. That would make me so happy. I could wear hey, it. Yeah. I, got, I got enough Kooji sweaters. I think I could do six, seven weeks of different sweaters every Wow. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. Uh, Paul wants to know how did Vince feel about talent dating? It seems in the past he would have been against it, but maybe he softened his stance over time. It seems like it's common nowadays. Was that ever taboo? Do you think talent dating? No, no that's kind of hard to regulate too. You're you're on. Think about it, man. You're on the road three hundred days a year with the same people. Those those people become your family. Those that's your crew. That's your ride or dies. That's your family as your brothers, your sisters, your lovers, your mothers, your fathers. Um, so 
where else are they going to go? If they find each other and, and things like that, it is what it is, man. You can't, it's just matters of the heart. Kind of hard to, to fuck with. Here's a great question. Uh, it's a little, it's silly, but I know you'll have an opinion. Thomas wants to know, is it world champion or world's champion? World heavyweight champion. Okay. I just feel like in the NWA, they used to call it world's heavyweight champion. Yeah. I mean, he didn't like that. I don't think that's the proper way to use it. You're the world heavyweight champion. You're the heavyweight champion of the world. You're not the heavyweight champion of the worlds. Yeah. I think that's, that's just mispronunciation of people through the years that have no idea. No, that's not how you say it. Bruce, I know what the question is in regards to, but I'm not sure what we can or can't say. So I'm just going to deflect here. He once said, quote, I have a big announcement to make. It's just not ready yet, but soon we will announce it. Did plans fall through or did you announce something? And I just missed it. You missed it because plans fell through. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plans fell through. Uh, Paul wants to know who was a ladies man that we wouldn't have guessed. Wilbur Snyder. Okay, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta throw that in my Google machine. Wilbur. Wilbur Snyder was a uh, old timer. I believe he was uh, in the Indianapolis area for Dick the Bruiser. Uh, and he was God, over with the ladies, was, huh? Or he was a hell of a ladies man. Lord Alfred Hayes. I Charmer. Think you've I think you've explained why too. He very, got a charming, lot of yeah, very, very charming British accent. And, and, uh, he could speak with the maidens and was just a disarming, wonderful man. Um, Alfred never met a stranger. I like that. Uh, smile wants to know what's the best after pay-per-view dinner. Now, I don't think he means like, uh, what do you like to eat after a pay-per-view? I think he means, does one in particular stand out? You guys had a pay-per-view, then you guys went to dinner and it was just a memorable time. Back in the day, we used to go to Morton's wherever they were. Uh, if they were in the town, we'd always have Morton stay open for us. But, um, that kind of changed as diets changed and not as much red meat, but uh, right now, you know, uh, the food of choice is two steak and one shrimp taco on the plane. That's if I'm well, hungry. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Davis wants to know who's your favorite celeb that you've produced. Um, I always say Leslie Nielsen, just cause he was so great. Um, wow, there, there's, there's a bunch. I, I think Leslie Nielsen was terrific. Snoop Dogg off the chart, just beautiful. Um, I mean, most of the time they've all been great. You, you only have a few kind of real shitty ones and, uh, Ruth Franklin wasn't great. Um, Burt Reynolds cussed me out in front of a room full of people, but at the end of the night came up and we shook hands and hugged and he apologized. Um, so there's, you know, there, there's an awful lot uh, through the years, but it's some guys can be assholes. And some guys can't, you know, I, I recall doing a convention and walking the convention floor and nobody really knew who I was and Henry Winkler, I literally bump into this old man and it's Henry Winkler, the Fonz. Hey. And he looks at my uh, badge and, you know, it's a talent badge and all this stuff. And he says, oh, hey, how you doing? Hello, my name is Henry Winkler. So what do you do? And I told him what I did. He goes, oh, hey. He goes, I go, hey. And uh, we talked for a little bit and he came over to the booth later on and said hello again. 
was just the the sweetest god man and since then i've always looked for um you read stories about celebrity interacting with i've never seen a bad story about an interaction with henry winkler no they don't exist because he just I, I don't think that there could be he just every every story reads true to what i experienced with him and i went to another convention that he was at and he came over just to say hello and and like found us came wow. over and, hey how's it going ah got a good line nice he he just loved to do that just walk around and say hi to people and i thought that was pretty neat um god who else was i gonna say um man i, mean, I know I, we talk, i know we don't talk about current stuff but i think you've had fun with logan paul logan paul's great yeah absolutely wonderful but uh you know from the from the old timers it it just was you got to spend time with a little bit more time with them and everything. Uh, Mark Cuban was great. Mark Cuban was a lot of fun to work with. Trump was fun to work with. Um, so it's it just different. I'm looking around the I'm looking around the room here, see if I see anybody that strikes a memory. Well, Burt Reynolds over there, but um, yeah, it just it just really depends. Really depends. I know you personally had a good time with uh, Vanna White, I think. Vanna White was great, yes. Yeah. She yeah. was magnificent to work with, uh, class act all the way. Pam Anderson, mm -hmm. class act all the way. Um, Jenna Jameson was probably fun. Jenna Jameson, class act all the way. Um, you know, being in Vanna's home um, was she just like gave us the run of the place. She was amazing. And Pam Anderson, and, and, and to think about it though, Pam Anderson and Vanna White, when I had the opportunity to work with them was at their peak of popularity. Yeah, absolutely. Like they were the hottest that they had ever been and, and ever worse, you know, even after that. Um, it just couldn't, couldn't have been nicer. The, the nicest, two people in every interaction since because I would always run into them at nappy conventions and things like that. They would always remember and just tremendous people. Aaron Sheik wants to know what did old school agents like blackjack Lanza and chief J strongbow think about wrestling becoming more gimmick and cartoon oriented. I think every every generation um, will have the opinion of our generation was better. What we did made more sense. These mm -hmm. kids today are killing the business. By God, none of this makes sense. This is horrible. The business will be dead inside of two years. I've heard that since the 70s from old timers. And I think that the first old timer that I can recall saying to me, wow, these kids today, man, I couldn't keep up with them the way they go today. He says, you know, I beat the hell out of people, but I don't think I'd last five minutes was Bull Curry. And Bull Curry recognized the athleticism. And that's what, you know, I'll sit there sometimes and I'll be watching. I'll go, you know, if the business was then what the business is today, I doubt that I ever would have trained a minute in the ring to be a wrestler it was different it was different training you learned to work you learn you you basically learned the, the tricks of the trade now you got to be a world-class athlete to step into the ring and even though the athletes of uh yesteryear were tremendous athletes different type of athlete now in the business so um yeah i think that you know jack and strongbow all of them jack Got it. Jack was very like, okay, but you know, the business is changing. So we got to change with it or we're going to die. Mm -hmm. And Jack would adapt. Uh, Strongbow, I think wanted it to be the way he was like, if it's not going to be the way it should be the way I see it, I don't want to do it anymore. So, you know, different strokes, different folks, different viewpoints. 
Skibo says, I have a coworker from humble Texas that grew up with the grappler. I remember him from the after mags, but did a little research and got his autobiography. I now think he might be one of the best masked American wrestlers ever. What did you think of Lynn Denton? Well, the human being Lynn Denton, uh, I thought the world of, I thought that Lynn was, uh, just a really great guy. Uh, started in Texas his his dad wrestled a little bit and his dad had uh, a bad leg, but Lynn started, started wrestling in the independence and things like that. But Lynn went out and made a name on his own. Lynn didn't stick around. What well, didn't try to make a name off of his dad or anything like that. And found the gimmick, the grappler and played it to the hilt and was, probably in the top five of mass men. And I mean that seriously with, you know, like the spoiler and Moscaris and people like that, of that era that, you know, the grappler was, he was real. He could work, man. He was tough. And by God, he had that, he had that gimp foot where he had to have that built up boot to help even him out and how difficult that was for him. And he overcame his handicap. Sometimes his ankle would get a little restless. He had to tap the toe of that boot and everything and kick you in the head and things like that. But <laughs> uh, when you're the greatest wrestler in the world and there ain't nobody left that can beat you, they don't call you a great wrestler, son. They call you the grappler. Oh, wow. I love that line. And But uh, to me, I thought Lynn Denton was uh, so underrated as the grappler. I thought he was awesome. And then he became Dirty White Boy, and uh, yeah, I, they, they were good, uh, Tony and Lynn, but I just liked Lynn as the grappler so much. J.H. Trimble wants to know, was Diesel an occupational gimmick? That he was actually an engine in his real life? No, like he was a truck driver. Was he a truck driver? Well, that's not what that's no that, that's not what diesel was about he wasn't, it wasn't well, a truck it? driver he was the engine oh, he was the okay. big badass diesel engine you could fucking would kill everything in his path and there was a shane mcmahon actually came up with that name because it was they would see like a big guy in the gym and everything and they go oh man he's diesel because he was big and strong and looked badass. That's how I got the name. I don't. I don't think they. Uh, I don't think they used just the word diesel. I think they used to say cock diesel. And you probably, man, Not if that was Kevin diesel. Nash's first name, cock diesel, that would have been tremendous. Yeah, like Dolph Ziggler, I never heard cock the cock thing. I heard just diesel. Throw it in your Google machine, cock diesel. It will pull up what you think. I promise. Uh, Jim Rittenhouse wants to know, are there any performers you wish you had a second chance with maybe the storyline or gimmick they were given just didn't work, but you really wish you had a second chance. Um, see, we never got him in his prime and his prime came off a late anyway, but I would love to have had a second chance with DDP. Hmm. But I wish we got him earlier. Yeah, I get that a lot earlier. Um, but DDP is a great answer. Yeah. He just, uh, I think that timing and everything just was, was not right for him. This is an interesting question. Uh, Steven wants to know who do you remember being the first wrestler you saw that had entrance music and what were your thoughts at the time about wrestlers having entrance music? Bad, bad Leroy Brown. Okay. South side of Chicago, the baddest man in town. And it was, um, it was phenomenal, man. Cause it made sense. Yeah. It's from the South side of Chicago. You know, the only thing that <laughs> when you listen to the song, Leroy gets his ass kicked in the end. Good. Leroy just totally gets his ass kicked. And <laughs> But Leroy Brown was, you know, big and bad and from the south side of Chicago. Uh, Jonathan wants to know, will you ever consider writing a book? 
You know, I opened it the other day. The one you started years ago? Yeah. Yeah. Once in a while, I'll read through what I have. And then I figure, eh, we'll start again. The book keeps getting longer, does it not? The number of, so I, I have it in my head now that uh, the, there's going to be several books. That The first book would be from birth until uh, leaving WWE the first time. There you go. Then the second book would be the WWE run the second time. The third book would be Life After. And then the fourth one would be Never Say Never. Hmm. What do you think the end of Never Say Never is going to be? Bruce died. <laughs> uh, sleeping. Uh, he forgot to put his mouth guard in that night. And he stopped breathing that 42nd time. But, uh, yeah. That'll be the end of the last one. Andy Kroll wants to know, when you first started in the WWF back in 87, who do you remember being the first guy? Let me ask guy you a question. Like... I'm sorry. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Yeah. Should I put all four books out at once or do one, then do the second one, then do the third one, then the fourth one's not going to happen for a while. But I say, I say do all four at once because I know you and you'll do one and then not do the rest. Call okay. it the, uh, the book of love. And there's yeah. the chron the chronicles, if you will, you know, yeah. part one, part two, part three, part four. And so you know, I, I am curious. I'm curious how you finish box that fourth set. one. Yeah. I got some ideas that I'll tell you about offline. I thought about oh. that the other day about little, little things you could include that maybe people haven't thought of. Yep. Uh, Andy wants to know who was the first guy that accepted you in the locker room back in 87. In 87? Yeah, when you in first... WWE or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. WWF, when you first come up. From... Well, it's... It's a weird place back then. Uh, you know, Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon were the first kind of to accept me and embrace me and kind of bring me in. I think from a talent perspective, you know, I had Jake there. Um, dog was there. Duggan was just coming back, so I had I had friends there. Um, but I guess the first WWE guy would probably be Hogan or Savage. Man, that's, rest of uh, the guys kind of a little off putting. Uh, Bob wants to know his opinion. What's the peak era of wrestling and will it ever be topped? Now he's asking you as a fan. I'm sure he doesn't mean you, the guy who's involved today, but as a fan, when you think about, man, I never loved it more than blank. I'm going to say for me personally, probably, you know, that 80, 85 to 89 period. Okay. Cause I don't think anybody could have called that and going from mid South and experiencing that high and then kind of that low, then going to WWE and experiencing that crazy high in a completely different atmosphere was good, crazy times. I think that's a fair, you know, answer. I always say 1997 and 1989, those are my two favorites, but man, there has been a lot of really fun stuff that we've got to do in recent years, but I don't know if everybody else had as much fun as we did. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Jackson wants to know, what do you hope you're remembered for? That's a great question. What do you want to be remembered for Bruce? I just want to be remembered. I think you that's don't have all. to worry about that. I, I think uh, 
I, yeah, I, I, wow. I don't know. Um, I would like to be remembered for being able to help talent and help guys get to the next level and help open their eyes to things that uh, they couldn't see before and help them to see the other side. Um, I, I always, you know, look at the guy that, that has, has it, but doesn't know what to do with it mm. and be able to help shape them and give them the opportunity to sprout wings and fly. So, um, you know, it, it's, I spent so long trying to be the guy in the background and not be noticed. And then when you're out there and you're, you know, this podcast did a lot for that of, of being noticed and getting that side of me in front of an audience that I never dreamed would be interested. Yeah. I, so I always like being the anonymous guy. I always like being the being the, the last one after everybody's uh, hugged and kissed and all that stuff to, to go up and tell them I'm proud of them, and give them a hug and do it. You know, it's tough, man, to do it with cameras all around you because you feel like you have to perform. And it's it's more of a yeah, I'd rather have those moments in private. And an interesting question about gorilla. How has gorilla evolved over the years? We've seen photos of you back in the day and it seems like it was often just you at a desk. Now we see gorilla and it feels like there's three, four, or sometimes more people. How has it evolved over the years? Well, it's gotten bigger. It's gotten more sophisticated when I did gorilla, when gorilla did gorilla, it was a table at the entrance with the monitor on it and a headset you told talent when to go. And you told them what they did wrong on the way back and gave time cues. And that was it. Nowadays, gorilla is a place where it's the last bastion before anybody goes through the curtain. It's a place where uh, everyone can congregate and get together and go over last minute details. It's a place for producers to sit. It's a place for uh, the show producers like, you know, Paul and myself to sit and be able to interact with the truck and everything in production. And you have trainers, you have doctors and everything that are right there. So it's just a, a more sophisticated area. Now you can talk to everybody anywhere from gorilla and communicate and it's our command center. Uh, Rob Van Graham wants to know if you could be a writer on a current non-wrestling TV show, what show would it be and why? Uh, would have been billions because of the anti-hero of, of Bobby Axelrod. I think that some people in writing that might've written that as Bobby Axelrod being the ultimate bad guy when in fact, uh, he was the ultimate baby face and being able to take the federal prosecutor who <coughs> saw himself as the ultimate baby face and write for him as the heel that he truly is. Uh, absolutely love it. Uh, you know, the other one is succession just because I've lived it. Well, on that note, uh, I think it's a, a great time to thank our sponsor, HelloFresh. Uh, boy, they've been making Hello. sure that me and you are eating good lately. They are truly America's number one meal kit. And it's because they let us all skip a trip to the grocery store. And we just count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. I mean, there's really something for everybody, but especially if you're in a time crunch, how about their quick and easy dinner options? We're talking meals in 15 minutes or less, not just dinner, but breakfast and lunches too. Uh, and they've also got uh, an opportunity for you to get out of that rut. That's really what my wife and I like the most. We found ourselves eating the same things over and over. 
Well, they've got a bunch of different stuff for you to choose from. How about 40 chef crafted recipes to choose from every week? You can do family friendly, you can do fit and wholesome. There's always something new and exciting. And they take all the stress out about meal planning and pre-portioned ingredients. Listen, when I go to the grocery store, I always wind up buying too much. I'm not exactly sure what my wife needs. So I think, well, I don't know if it's this one or this one. Heck, I'll just get both. They're going to send you exactly what you need. You're not going to have a bunch of garbage leftovers. You're not going to have a whole bunch of food going to waste in the refrigerator. And you're not going to forget anything. They make it easy. And I have to admit, I was a little intimidated when I first heard of some of these recipes and thought, I don't know if I can do that. Dude, they use so easy, I can do it. Not only is it better for you, is it fresher? And when I say fresher, I mean it. It goes from farm to your front door in as little as seven days. It's fantastic. It tastes great. And it's more affordable. How much more affordable? How about 25% cheaper than takeout? Yeah, it's less expensive than grocery shopping too because you get those pre-portioned ingredients. It's exactly what you need and nothing else. They don't just have your regular meals lined up. They've got all kinds of add-ons. Maybe you're looking for snacks or sides. You've got over a hundred different ones to choose from. I highly recommend this. It is going to be a unique experience for you, especially if you've got a spouse in your life. Man, when they see you're gonna help cook too, let me just tell you, it pays dividends. I can't recommend it enough. Go out of your way to check it out. My wife and I loved it, and you will too. It's HelloFresh.com slash 50STW, and use our code 50STW. You'll get 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50STW, and use the code 50STW for 50% off plus free shipping. Uh, it's HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Hello. Uh, uh, here's one from... Um, Quentin Morgan, do all the wrestlers know the outcome of every match on the card? No. Thanks for that. Well, uh, yes or no? No, question. yeah, it is. Okay, it is. Uh, Justin wants to know what's the slowest hour in your time in wrestling, and what was the fastest? So when you think about one painful show or one stressful show where it just felt like time stood still. Tell us about that. And then what was like, you blink and it's over. Well, it's the same for, it's the, it's the same show for uh, both answers. And that okay. would be the nights, the night that the lights went out. Did oh, you know? the in your house. Uh -huh. yeah. Beware a dog. It was, uh, it was as if time stood still and every second, and was slow and then you blinked and it was over so yeah it was it was struggling to have a b and a c plan and just you're waiting on mother nature man you're waiting on an act of god <laughs> to help us out here a little bit and it it just drugged uh, um, and you you would rethink your A, B, and C plan. You'd have a D, F, G, L, Y, Z plan, and uh, and then before you know it, it was over. And I remember when it was over, I'm thinking, what aired? What did we do? Because I was so busy doing everything else, trying to get through it. I had no idea what we actually did. And those times during that blackout, it felt like we were out for five hours. So crazy. Interesting question here uh, that we've never talked about. I don't think John wants to know who did the Playboy Buddy Rose blow away diet vignettes, and why did that never amount to anything? It was so the the blow away diet was something we were sitting. In a, like a Denny's or what have you. And uh, Buddy had finished up and Buddy was coming out of the restaurant. We were sitting by the window. He sees us and waves and he came back in and he's talking to us. He says, Hey, I got an idea. He says, it's a blow away diet. You know how I carry my scale and I'm 217 pounds. He says, what if he goes, you know, you do this thing, man, where it's a blow away diet where I have, you know, this powder and I just put it all over me and 
uh, turn a fan on and, and the powder blows everything off. And I'm like, I'm really sad. And then he, he explained the whole ad to us. Like he's standing there and he's got a big, uh, he's got a sad smile on his face. He's, you know, is this you 294 pounds of blah, 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 blah. Well, I, and you're really sad and you're all hunched over. Well, with the blow away diet, after one application of blow away, this could be you. And it's the same shot, except he's smiling. And like, hey, look at how great I look now. And uh, you do the thing where it's like, it goes, want to eat another piece of cake? Take a giant piece of cake, eat it. No problem. Want another sandwich? No problem. You just blow, blow, blow the weight away. And we shot it one afternoon in the studio. <laughs> and no matter how big, here's the, the inside secret. No matter how big the fan, because we got like those big industrial fans, because we think we're, that's what we're going to need to to blow it away. And we got the big boxes, the uh, like detergent size boxes, filled them up with baby powder. And when Buddy put it all on, he turned the fans on, it like just blew the top mist off. That was it. But when he did like this and rubbed his stomach and rubbed his arms and everything, but shit went everywhere. It's like, whoa, 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 stop. So we stopped it all down and we powdered them all up and then realized, you know, rub it and it'll all blow off. And, you know, watch the weight. Just blow, blow, blow away. 1-800-L-A-R-D-A-S-S. That's right. Call 1-800-L-A-R-D-A-S-S. Who had more fun with that, you, buddy, or Vince? <laughs> Dude, we laughed so fucking hard. And, of course, we just laughed at it when we heard it. But, oh, my God, you know, Buddy's so entertaining as he's telling us, you know, how it's going to work and shit. And then we're like, let's do it. Let's 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 do this, and um, and we did. <laughs> so yeah, just blow, blow, blow the weight away. It's the blow away diet. You want to be happy like this guy? And yeah. And AC Red AC Reddick wants to know: Could you have seen Kevin Sullivan as a talent in the '80s or in a backstage role in any era? Kevin the Devil. Yes. Yeah, I never got to work with Kevin. So, um, why do you think he know. never got a, a, a sniff with the WWF? What's up with that? It feels like after WCW went down, there would have been a spot for him somewhere. Yeah, I, I think that it was probably more out of reputation, um, and not a good good reputation at that. Uh, that people didn't want to do business with him. I didn't know him one way or the other. Uh, my brother Tom and Kevin were friends. I've become friends with Kevin. I think he's a smart guy and uh, had some great ideas. They're not everybody's cup of tea, but not everybody is everybody's cup of tea. I think you need variety anyway. And Kevin was, uh, for whatever reason, just never made it here. When you say reputation, you don't mean creatively. You mean maybe off the field stuff? I think... I think the, I think there was a, a fear that Kevin just knew the dark shit. Mm, Kevin was okay. a heat guy. I got you. And that's all he knew. Um, I don't know that necessarily to be true. And I'm not sure I support that because in order to, to get heat, you have to have over baby faces to get heat on. And they usually mm -hmm. got their, their comeuppance. Um, but again, it's like I said, I'd never worked with him, so I had nothing to judge him on. Matt's Forever wants to know if the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette left WCW in the summer of 1990 to join the WWF, how would you have booked them? And do you think Cornette could have been a better placement than Piper on commentary during that period? I think that uh, the Midnight Express could have been great fodder for the rockers shit for any team they were 
Midnight Express, exceptional team. One of the best of all time. Um, top five, and that's not – they were one of the greatest tag teams ever uh, to put on a pair of boots. So they could have worked with any and everybody, and it would have been believable. They were just that good. And I – Do you think – You're going to ask me which rendition I like. The rend- To me, the, the best Midnight Express combination was Bobby and Dennis and Jim. Yes. And uh, Bobby and Stan was fine, but I just thought that Bobby and Dennis was a compliment of all three of those guys doing what they did best. You said uh, they would have had a great spot and they would have been fodder for the rockers. That almost makes me think uh, that I need a follow up question. Do you think they had the look that Vince would have pushed, or would their look have meant that they were just making other teams look good? No, I think that they could have been, especially with Cornette, I think they could have been tag team champions for a long time. And again, their work in the ring. Did Bobby look like a killer? No. But Bobby looked like a smart and worked like a smart worker and to his strengths. And you believed it because they were a great tag team. I guess what I want to ask is, why do you think it didn't happen? Because Cornette did wind up. up. Cornette didn't want to fly. Okay. Cornette didn't want to fly all over the place. He was dead set against that. Uh, Christopher wants to know, was there ever a chance of bringing back Lex Luger after he left in 1995? No. No. You just know, the we, way he left or just a failed experiment didn't work. All the above. Okay. All the above at that point. I, and by the time that, you know, Le, I think Lex was one of those guys, he had a contract that he could just sit and wait and be paid out. And I don't believe that Lex believed he would do anything with us based on how he left. I think everybody's over it, but. I think that yeah. uh, at the time, timing and everything that it was, I don't think that Lex's name was never brought up. Uh, ADD wants to know, name three wrestlers or WWE employees, dead or alive, you'd like to have one last party with. Oh, God. Unfortunately, too many. Uh, you know, probably Roddy. Mm. Where's one? Two more. Eddie. All right. One more. And um, I'd say Eddie Gilbert. Eddie Gilbert. Wow. That's a name I didn't expect. I thought you were going to say Dusty or Piper or Gorilla. I mean, there's so many, but yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Yeah. Eddie Gilbert, Eddie Guerrero. Bobby's up there, but yeah. Man, Bobby and Roddy are probably number one and number two. I love that. Uh, who invented or came up with the idea for the Titan Tron early ideas of superstars having video entrances? So, who can do you remember who said, Hey, we should do a video wall and have a Titan Tron? Uh, who deserves credit for that? I want to say it was Vince, and I want to say it was in a meeting with Bonnie Hammer from the USA Network where we were changing our set and we were going to go huge and have this big stage. Um, but I think it was a combination of a lot of people like Kevin Dunn and uh, some of the folks in lighting and, and what have you to create this larger than life immersive experience for the live audience uh, more than anything, but to give ourselves a, a grandiose stage to be a part of and have the, the world's largest Tron. That was the idea. Big Extra talks about uh, Bam Bam Bigelow, says he was his favorite all-time big man in the WWF. Amazing look and athleticism. What led to his departure in 95? And why did he never have a run with any championship? I think that he just kind of ran his course. And we had done everything we could do, baby face and heel. I think Bam Bam wanted more. And... You know, time is time. And it was just time for Bam Bam to go on and learn a new hold. 
Uh, here's one. Uh, Eddie wants to know what was the worst Vince McMahon freak out you ever witnessed? <laughs> God, too many of those to even, even consider. I think, you know, probably the, the, I smeared shit all over the business and killed Bill Goldberg's career was a good one. Um, the, the time that the, uh, prosthetic person that did Bob Orton's face in Washington, DC, uh, he was not happy about that, but, uh, that was equaled by my reaction to that as well. Um, Vince, Vince was freaking out during Kurt Angle and Shane too, right? That was a good one. Yeah. 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 That was definitely an intense moment. Yes. Well, listen, guys, uh, it's time to tell you that cold turkey may be great on sandwiches, but there is a better way to break your bad habits. And we're not talking about some weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor or some Dave Meltzer rumor and innuendo. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume. And you see, they look at the problem in a different way. You see, not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-nominated device that does just that. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses all-natural, delicious flavors. You get it. Instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy, and it makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for your fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. And first off, let me just tell you, my wife tried this and absolutely loves the taste of the crisp mint. She says it's way more flavorful than she thought, and it feels very fresh. She also told me it's well-weighted, just feels good in her hand. It's fun to play with. It's perfectly balanced. And by the way, we're talking about something that's beautiful. It's made of real wood and it's got a cool shape. I don't know, man. It just looks and feels cool. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to fume, man, it's easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over a hundred thousand customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use the code WRESTLE to save 10% when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use the code WRESTLE to save an additional 10% off your order today. Uh, Charlie Thrower wants to know, how much easier is it to produce shows out of the country than it was, say, 20 or 30 years ago? Has that changed? Well technology has changed. So it's not as difficult. Uh, most countries have caught up, but there's still, there still is challenges with technology and just different systems. And I believe that we are, you know, we, we have our, we built our own truck. You know, we don't lease a truck or anything. We built our own truck to fit us in what we do. And they're different than other trucks. So I wouldn't, People would think they would want to rent out our truck and they look at it and go, whoa, this is nothing like what we have. It's, this is too big. I don't know what to do with all this stuff. Um, then when you go, we have to, most of the time we will rebuild. A, we have to build a makeshift control room because their trucks overseas are about a quarter of the size of what our production truck is. And so we have to build an actual production room. So there are challenges like that, that you just have to, man, you, you can do everything, uh, everything right. And it can work all day long. You can rehearse things 20 times. And then for some reason, by God, when you get ready to go, something will go out every time. And, and that that happens on international. You can almost set your watch by it. Kevin Lewis wants to know why were the colored belts used for so damn long in 98, 99 purple became black. Doesn't presentation matter. I love when we get an inside baseball question like this about belts, but you know, these days, thanks to HD, I think you guys have more belts and take better care of them, but 
nobody really cared about belts in 98 99 right yeah i don't know what color belts you're talking about i know gold dust had a gold belt warrior used to have colored uh belts um the intercontinental title was purple and uh i don't and like ever the remember era. being who was it purple with the rock when they when you left the reggie design and you went to an oval that was a purple belt and the european title i think it was like a green strap that, with like a red that, backing. that one was green yeah 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 so there and, and then you had the world title that was blue you know when, right after wrestlemania austin brought out the new design instead of the classic winged eagle it was the big eagle uh, or i guess vince presented it to him but it was like a, a blue leather. So yeah, it's interesting that we tried different colored leathers back then. Speaking yeah, of color, I, but see, I don't remember that, and I, I'm, I'm trying to look it up right now, and I don't see rock anywhere with a purple belt. I see them for like for sale and stuff like that. Steve, the one was blue for a while. Mm -hmm. Um. But other than stuff that's made, I don't see rock with a purple one. Maybe we did, but I don't remember that. That's why, but like, uh, we did the gold dust had different colors, warrior had different colors to match his tights and shit. He had yellow and purple and green and light blue and all kinds of stuff. That was character, that was for his character. Um, and then we've had white ones on different things. I think it just kind of depends upon the the talent themselves and what works at the time. Uh, let's do one here from uh, Meme Bastard Charles Kahn. He wants to know. I'd love to know how Bruce gets his face so red for Brother Love. It's full of love. <laughs> All right, there's our answer. Uh, Dave That's McClay wants to know. What's Bruce's favorite food from Kowloon? Them the, the wings. Oh yeah, the soccer. Actually, wings. I don't know that there really is any bad food from Kowloon. So I like the, I like his uh, General So's chicken, and I like his wings and fried rice, chicken fried rice. Uh, Wes Gay says we know Rock, Austin, Batista, and DDP have careers post wrestling. Who else left the ring and had successful ventures outside of wrestling, Bruce? Um, God, I'm sure a lot of guys did. Uh, Chavo Guerrero. Yes. You know, here, here's the guy who went out and became the go-to guy for Hollywood as far as stunt work and coordinating, especially when it comes to wrestling, but he's, he's ventured into other things and extremely sharp guy and has made a great living outside of, outside of the business by taking his skills that he learned in the business to Hollywood. Speaking of Hollywood, uh, we're going to finish on a question. I know you love so much, Bruce. Beer we go Steelers wants to know. Quick question about current stuff. How big is Batista's next movie agreement? You'd have to ask him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to episode 401 of Ask Bruce. More questions here on and something shit. to wrestle with. Yes, there you go. All that. You get all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. We've got tons of great bonus content. I recently sat down with your great close personal friend, Zach Gowan, and uh, it's for a series we call The False Finish. It's exclusive to adfreeshows.com, so be sure to check that out there. And we've got an episode of The Insiders we just loaded up with Dan Bynum, uh, the man who uh, was behind the Freebirds Bad Street Music USA video, and of course, so many other innovations along with his pal, Keith Mitchell down in world class. Uh, and who could forget Kevin Sullivan has a Tuesday series, Tuesdays with the Taskmaster, all available now for you over at adfreeshows.com. Also, I want to mention if your business targets men 25 to 54 years old, no better place to advertise than right here with us. Uh, be sure to check out advertisewithbruce.com to find out how affordable it is for you. Uh, I should also plug that we can help you save money at savewithconrad.com. Now is an excellent time to skip your next two house payments. Take a little break, right? It's Labor Day is right around the corner. How about we take a break from house payments for a couple of months? We can help you do that. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. But if you've got credit card debt, man, it's not a matter of if we can save you money. It's a matter of how much. I told the story here on the program a few weeks ago. We helped a listener save $681 a month 
and they got to skip their next two house payments and you can do it too. Find out how much money you can save right now for free at savewithconrad.com. I also want to mention, we can help you get out of that apartment and into a house. And also should remind you that, uh, nobody ever gets lower rent, but you will be able to refinance in the future when these rates drop and get a lower monthly payment. But in the meantime, start building equity for your family instead of your landlord's family. You can still buy a house with no money down. And the first step is to get a plan. We can help you do that at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. And hey, just talk, don't just take my word for it. We've got an A-plus rating with the BBB and over a 1,000 five-star reviews you can read for yourself at conradreviews.com. If you've got a question for next week's show, man, you can ask it to us on social media. We're at Pritchard Show on Twitter and Instagram. Something to Wrestle over on Facebook. Uh, lots of new swag and whatnot over at something to wrestle shirts.com. I mean, really fun stuff you should check out uh, and let everybody know that you support the show. But the easiest and cheapest and best way to support the show is to just like us on YouTube. Throw us a comment. Uh, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. It's something to wrestle.com. Bruce, thanks for all the time today, man. I, uh, I love just picking your brain and covering a lot of different topics. And I feel like we did that here today. We did. Thank you. I had fun. I drank a whole drink and I'm ready to go. And finally got the email from Silva for the lake. Well, there today. you go. There you go. So if we're, we're, we're had, we're, well, I don't want to jinx it, but let's call it a streak two in a row on time. Hopefully we'll see you this time next week, right here with a brand new episode of right something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Rock on. Hey guys, Tony Schiavone. Need to call a timeout real quick. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling what happened when listeners for a while now about all the cool things happening over on adfreeshows.com. Conrad sits down with a pioneer of wrestling television production, director Dan Bynum, who discusses his journey through WCW, ROH, MLW, and where it all began for him, world class. What really was... The, uh, the thing that, that catapulted it was one, working with Ric Flair. He came to the territory and wrestled with the Von Erich boys and gave us so much uh, gravitas. And two, the greatest feud in the history of wrestling, the Freebird Von Erich feud. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were there at the hottest time with the hottest show and we took over the world. The Yeti, Ron Reese, sits down with Ad Free Shows members to talk about his infamous night at Halloween Havoc and how it was received by the boys in the back. Oh, no, I rain. remember, like, Arn Anderson told me that that was the drizzling shits and Dusty Rose is like, that was the worst thing I've ever seen. I'm just like, hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com.